Hello, this is Richard Thornton. Good to be talking with you again. Sixteen years ago, a group of Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminole people from around the United States got together on the internet. We had many questions of each other. Who were we? Where did our ancestors come from? Where did they live after they got here? What achievements did they accomplish? These were questions that were not being answered fully by academia, and the truth was very seldom did any of these anthropologists ever talk to us about what we knew. So we were going to take our own route. It's a journey that's had many surprises because we had no theories. That's absolute truth. We just followed the evidence as it took us. But today we're going to talk about events decades ago when the seeds were first planted. It's an interesting story and it's filled with irony. Uh, and again, ironically, we're now discovering that there is a connection with Teotihuacan with events that occurred in the southeast among our ancestors. So we shall begin our journey. It's the summer of 1967, a time of turmoil in the United States. The Vietnam War was getting worse and worse. People were beginning to demonstrate in the streets. Uh, violent factions were beginning actual terrorism in the United States, ostensibly in protest of war, but mainly it was an excuse for them to express their own frustrations with their own lives. It was a summer I would be turning 18 then, which made you legally adult. I'd have the right to vote and to drink at age 18 and also be drafted. But being drafted really wasn't a worry of mine. Uh, right after I got a letter of acceptance from Georgia Tech, two fine U.S. Navy officers showed up at my high school and offered me a contract. Unbelievable. It's just amazing. Uh, they offered for if I committed to a being a reserve science and engineering officer of the Navy, I would get benefits while I was in Georgia Tech and then afterwards be given a commission above that of an ensign. Normally a Naval Academy graduate gets ensign, I'd be a lieutenant, junior grade lieutenant, and very soon would be making more than a private sector architect. So I was certainly committed to the three years after graduation to the CBs, but considering a, a lifetime career with the Navy at that time. So it was, my future was pretty well planned out for the next eight years. But during that summer, I kept on having this strange dream. Now keep in mind, I'd never been any farther west than Birmingham, Alabama, or farther north than Finley, Ohio. And yet the dream would begin in this arid valley, flat valley surrounded by mountains with Vegetation is totally unfamiliar to me. I was an outdoorsy guy, but I've never seen these plants before, but yet I, I knew them in detail in the dreams. And around the mountains, they looked different than those in the southeast. They were rather barren looking. I would start walking towards the largest mountain. The uh, Then I would start climbing this mountain. And it was nothing like the mountains I knew in the southeast, the Appalachians. Uh, they were rocky, huge gray and black rocks and interspersed with types of vegetation that I never seen before in person, but associated with the desert or maybe the arid west. They were uh, cacti and other types of strange olive colored plants. It looked just like this photograph. And part two will explain why it looks like this photograph. But anyway, as I got to the top of this high mountain, I came to a a Native American dressed in white clothing like a typical uh, campesino in Mexico, uh, wearing a hat, a straw hat, and I'd ask him directions. Where do I go from here? Where am I? He would say nothing. He would just look around at his goats who were grazing in the brush around him. And finally, I said, where do I go from here? And he pointed to his right, which would be to my left, towards up the mountain a little bit. So I followed that route. I came to this wall formed of huge boulders. I climbed over the wall and there I was in a kind of a vision of paradise. It was a beautiful green pasture surrounded by healthy trees, more typical of what you see in temperate climates. Uh, really a vision of paradise. And then the, the dream would end right there. 
Then a night or two later, I'd have the same dream again. I never understood it, and as time approached to go to school, I forgot about the dream almost and began my life as a student. But it would have great significance two years later, three years later. We'll move on. It all began with our sophomore term design project, which was design of a house on a Georgia island that was in a pristine natural state and had no electrical telephone service. It was uninhabited island. In that era, your grade on the sophomore term project generally determined whether or not you would be allowed to continue in the architecture program at Georgia Tech. I don't think it's that way now, but that was how it was then. It was a five-year program. A student could even have all A's in his or her other classes, but if he or she did poorly in that last sophomore architecture design lab, they would be expelled from the architecture school. They wouldn't be expelled from Georgia Tech, but they could not take architecture class again. They'd have to go into another career. Meanwhile, I believe it's around February of 1969, I saw a little note on the bulletin board of the architecture school signed by Dr. Arthur Kelly, who was director of the anthropology department at the University of Georgia. He was looking for an architect student to volunteer to prepare an ink on mylar plastic site plan of a famous archaeological site then on the Chattahoochee River called 9FU14. It was near Six Flags Over Georgia. It had gotten a lot of publicity in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and also had been featured in some TV programs, but the owners of the property, the Great Southwest Corporation, were requesting an as-built drawing to engineer quality scale to turn into the building department for Fulton County. Uh, they did not accept the site plans sketched with ballpoint pen that the archaeologists had turned in. That was not acceptable to the, to the county government. <clears throat> so I had no particular interest in archaeology or my Native American heritage at that time. When I started, at least, I only took the volunteer job in order to meet girls. You see, there were only 128 female students at Georgia Tech at the time. All of them were taken, and I didn't have a car, so I wanted some way to find female friendship where I could reach them by bus or by walking or whatever. And by golly, I did do that. That was a successful part of the campaign. Meanwhile, back at Georgia Tech, we were turning in our design projects for spring quarter. Most students designed white concrete modernist mansions, which would dominate the ancient maritime forests of Georgia's coast, plus have no connection to the historic architects of the region. Few students even considered where the electricity and drinking water would come for their egocentric creations, and they certainly didn't consider how the people would handle their sewage and garbage or even go get groceries. In other words, these are houses that would never be built in that situation. The county governments and the state government would never allow such things to go on our beaches of our pristine and uninhabited islands. But that's just the way things were back then in architecture. I took a different approach, maybe it was because I was Native American. Uh, I designed with nature. It certainly was not a house that would want to expect to see on the cover of Progressive Architecture magazine, but it's a house that probably would be built and be acceptable to community. It was compact, low profile. It'd be invisible only a few hundred yards away. Uh, built with local materials. It'd be only such things as nails and sheet metal to, to bring over by boat. It was going to make it out of the the trees growing there on the island. I used active and passive solar, which was then not the end thing. It'd be another decade before architects would be interested in such things. I used rainwater harvesting because the people had to have water. Uh, they couldn't drink salt water. Uh, the other architects didn't even think about that. It'd be about three decades before other architects would think about rainwater harvesting. And it was shaded by live oaks to minimize the load on air conditioning. And I got an A minus. Hooray! That was a good grade in architecture. I felt good. I was go for the flow for finishing the architecture program uh, with that sort of grade. I, I was clear sailing, I thought, because I had other good grades by the classes that quarter too, so everything was looking up. But then later that week, 
my design lab professor changed the architecture faculty's jury from an A minus to an F. Oh my gosh. This meant that I'd be expelled from the architecture school. He gave me a D for the quarter, even though all my other scores on my other projects were A's and B's. Outrageous. It seems that I, later on I learned that he, three days after the jury, this professor walked into the exhibition hall in the architecture school, erased the A on my main drawing, and marked in an F before some astonished onlookers. He told the students that I didn't look like an architect. Now, I don't know what that means. Was it because I was uh, masculine looking or muscular or too tall or he didn't like Native Americans to be architects? I don't know. It was never explained. But he also raised the grades of three of his favorite students who are in the cult like him. None of them ever graduated, however. I went immediately across the hall to the offices of the architecture department director, Paul Heffernan, and told him what had happened. He responded that Georgia Tech's rules prevented him from changing grades made by professors. I said, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. I had grades from professors, six professors and a formal jury. Then this guy came in and changed their grade. He had no role in the jury. I said, that's not the same thing, but he said he's nothing he could do about it. Maybe he thought I didn't look like an architect either. I was quite a bit more masculine than him, as you know what I mean. Um... But after learning that the department director had refused to do anything, despite the design lab's professors saying that I didn't look like an architect, I remember the fact that he designed jury. Ike Saporta, who was from Greece, secretly gave me a copy of the jury's review sheet showing that all six professors had scored my work from a B to an A+. He told me to go up the hill right now to see Dean of Students Jim Dole. Well, it was raining, but I was very, very angry. And so I wrapped my drawings in sheet plastic and charged up the hill, doing a little profanity along the way. Dean Dole quickly realized what had happened. I showed him the drawings. You could even see part of the A on the drawing, it had not been fully erased and had been, the F had been drawn over the A. I showed him the sheet from the design jury that I had made either B's or A's according to all the jurors. And so this was totally unjustified. He first said, well, the same rules prevent me from interfering with the grading of a professor, but we'll see what we can do. So it was for the first time in Georgia Tech history that the Dean of Students requested that my grade be raised so that I would be continuing an architecture program. In other words, change the grade. Uh, Dean Jim Dole became a lifelong friend until just a few years ago when he died. He was living up in the Dacucci Valley at the time. What he did was he didn't order the professor to change the grade. What he did is he reminded the professor that his contract was up for review in a few months and that they would consider this incident uh, significantly in determining whether or not he would return to Georgia Tech as a professor. Uh, so that professor did change my grade. He copied the letter to Dean Heffernan, and I think Heffernan got the message too that Dean Dole was not very pleased with how they'd handled the situation. So I was continuing architecture. That problem was over with. They gave me a C, which still was unfair, but that's certainly better than a D or an F. Three weeks later, June 22nd, 1969, I was back on the 9FU-14 site. What happened was that earlier that spring, the Georgia State University anthropology students had been banned from the site on weekends. They had been camping out on weekends and using illegal drugs and cohabitating in tents. <gasps> oh, how terrible. And... Um, the police had been called several times, and so they were banned unless from coming there anywhere unless there was a professor on the site supervising. The problem was that Utoy Creek had flooded that week and cut through the archaeological site, exposing hundreds or thousands of artifacts, according to a construction worker. Dr. Kelly was out of town at a conference, so he called me up and 
asked me to go out there. So he knew I was an, a naval midshipman and actually was tested for drugs, but I wasn't interested in legal drugs anyway. And we also couldn't drink heavily. If we got a DUI, we'd also lose our contract. So I was a rather squeaky clean uh, per person back then, let's say. Um, so he asked me to go out to the site and take photographs of the damage done by the creek and close enough where we could see the, the artifacts and also pick up a sample of potsherds from the soil, which he would then analyze. He said he wanted to create a potsherd boat, whatever that was. I brought along Susan Muse, who was a friend of mine from high school and from my church. She was part Creek. She had two years in art from Young Harris College, which is very close to the Track Rock archaeological site, and she was transferring to Georgia State. She went on to become a highly respected artist and art educator, and she spent most of her adult life living in Blairsville, which is the nearest major town to Track Rock. And in a touch of sad irony, uh, I later learned that she died of cancer at the very moment that the first program was being filmed there by the Travel Channel. So I, I had no way of knowing it, but it was about a month before I learned that she had died. But uh, we were together, we we're friends, and the following week, we had, we had seen a guy drive out there, just as we were finishing up, and he opened up the fence, and he dug a hole and pushed something inside the hole of the mound, then locked the gate and came out again, and he saw me, he came roaring over to us, blowing dust, and he cussing us out. He called me a pot hunter or something like that. And I said, well, no, I was here because Dr. Kelly asked me to. You're not even supposed to be here. I had permission, and you don't. And he said he was going to call the police. I said, well, call the police. You know, and then they can call Dr. Kelly and say, I was the one that was supposed to be here, and you weren't supposed to be here. He drove on. <clears throat> well, the following week, newspaper had headlines that proof was found that 9FU14 was an agricultural village, that they'd found an, a stone hoe. On Monday morning, after the Sunday afternoon, we'd seen the guy messing with the mound. I said, uh-oh, I think that guy put that hoe in that mound because he found it exactly where I saw him doing the hoe. Um, you know, but I was in home, I had other things, I was working a summer job, you know, just reading the news, but then, two days later, the headlines from the newspaper and from the evening TV news was that Dr. Kelly was in big trouble and he was about to be arrested, that they were accusing him of stealing a stone hoe that he'd actually personally dug up about 10 years early at the, at the, uh, Manville site on the lower Chattahoochee River and that he had stolen it from the architecture lab and planted it in the mound in order to make people think that he had found an agricultural site. Well, that was too much. I said, that's, that's baloney. He shouldn't be framed. I don't know why these people are trying to frame him, but they were. So I called up the Athens police. At that time, there was not a campus police at University of Georgia or very little. The, any criminal cases were handled by the city of Athens told them what we had seen. I gave them Susan's name and they called Susan. She verified everything I had said. And that let Dr. Kelly off the hook. He was not investigated any further. And then when the people involved realized that several professors and students at the University of Georgia were the ones who actually stole the hole and did the whole thing, it was all hushed up. So no one was arrested and it was quietly silenced. But Later on that year, Dr. Kelly was forcibly retired. Uh, he never taught again at the University of Georgia. What teaching or archaeological activities he had after that was at Georgia State University or independently. But he was a broken man as far as his reputation in Georgia was. He still had friends elsewhere in the United States, but he was considered a pariah in Georgia because he had gone public just prior to this incident with a stolen hoe and announced that he had found artifacts on the Chattahoochee River that either were from Mexico or were copies of artifacts from Mexico, and that outraged other professors because that meant he was saying that there was direct contact between Mexico and Georgia. Well, duh, 
I mean, we Creeks, I've always said that our ancestors are from Mexico, Peru, and South America. Uh, my Native American DNA is labeled Mesoamerican. We knew that. Again, that's what we're telling you. These archaeologists, these historians never talk to us. They're assuming stupid, or Creeks are not stupid. My mother was my mother was a valedictorian of her high school class. She was the first person in her family at Georgia allowed to go to public school, mind you. She went on and was graduated summa cum laude from the University of Georgia in a full scholarship and went on to get a sixth year and a master's degree in education and become teacher of the year in Georgia. We're not dummies, but the archaeologists treat us like we're subhuman or either we don't exist. So anyway, we'll move on. But that's the situation. It still is that situation. But that fall, we got back and on that same bulletin board was a announcement of the Barrett Fellowship. Architect Sid Barrett had donated large sum of money to a fellowship to support students going overseas to, to study uh, architectural urban planning research outside the United States. Let me make it clear, outside the United States. Uh, it was limited to fifth year thesis architecture students, graduate students, and planning students in graduate school. I was a junior, therefore I was not eligible. But I, I went in. I said, I got to get out of here. I want to see the world. I'm tired of just hanging around this part of the United States. And, and you know, especially after studying architectural history for two years, you want to see these buildings. And I said, what I really want to go is go to Mexico. I always wanted to see the pyramids. Knew nothing about them really at the time, or very little about them. Knew nothing about my Creek heritage. It's just a matter I wanted to get out of the country. It's kind of like the situation of me being on the archaeological side. It was not for me wanting to be an archaeologist or even being interested in it. I just wanted to meet girls. Well, this time, the, the original incentive was me just to get out of the country. I got a whole lot more than I bargained for because $1,000 in 1970 is equal to $7,500 in 2019. So I was able to do a lot of traveling. But there was a problem. I was not a graduate student. I went to my faculty supervisor, who been and none other one like supporter. My big supporter, supporter became my supporter <laughs> uh, for my career. And he said, yeah, he said that, that was a very good idea that actually the professor who had taught pre-Columbian architecture had died in a house fire and they'd lost all the slides and that I could use that as a justification as I was going to replace the the slides of Mesoamerica. They were formerly in the Georgia Tech Library. Um, so part of my proposal was to prepare at least 2,500 color slides while I was in Mexico and Central America. Ike supporter said, you just might get it. Just go ahead and do your proposal. We'll see what we can do. I have some friends. Oh, yes, he did have some friends. <laughs> it turns out he was friends with Arthur Kelly Ike was president of the Atlanta Archaeological Society. Uh, another shared friend was John S. Pennington, who I befriended while at the uh, site on the Chase River. John was a Creek Indian from Americus, Georgia, and a friend of Jimmy Carter. So we had a clique. I don't know if these guys are all on the jury. I think some of them were, but they had a lot of political influence between the three of them. And it was, you can call it a conspiracy, but it was a conspiracy, I confess. I got the Mexico on a conspiracy. Well, there's one hang up. One person on the jury was kind of balking. That was Jiyun Hoke Harris. He was the architect of the Etowah Mounds Museum. Uh, he was, of course, a wretched architect and nationally recognized sculptor. He was director of the art department at Georgia Tech and a friend of Arthur Kelly, Lou Larson, Ike Supporter. Larson and Kelly had been the archaeologists for the big dig at Etowah Mounds. That's the connection. Now, uh, Junian was very interested in pre-Columbian architecture and in, unlike most other, he was very interested in Creek culture. On most of his buildings, he would use our art as decoration on the building. So in his heart, he wanted me to go. But he had some valid complaints that I really was not qualified to do what I was proposing to do in Mexico, as was educationally. So he agreed to waive the requirement for a postgraduate student 
to back my proposal, if I, prior to leaving for Mexico, I took two courses in photography, commercial photography, a course in ceramic arts, so I'd learned how to hand make Indian style pottery, uh, ceramics art history of the Americas, one course in ceramic engineering, so I'd understand the science and technology of making pottery and, and concrete, actually. Um, and then a course in Anthropology of the Americas, which was taught by Lou Larson, who was, who was at the uh, Etowah site. Shortly after I was approved for the project, there was a little notice in the Atlanta Journal of Constitution I'd been awarded the fellowship, and the Mexican consul saw it. You see, the, the, the New Mexican Consul Atlanta was a licensed architect and a graduate of Georgia Tech. And it so happened that direct flights between Atlanta and Mexico City were to begin in June 1970. That is the exact same month that I was planning to start my fellowship in Mexico. To promote these flights, he informed Georgia Tech that I would be designated an official guest of Lesiones Exteriores, which is their State Department, and my search would be coordinated by the famous archaeologist Dr. Roman Pinochan of the Museo Nacional de Antropología and Dr. Ignacio Bernal, director of the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia. Those names might not mean much to you, but in the late 20th century, they were the two greatest archaeologists in the world. That's when their peak of their career, they were making discoveries in Mexico that would completely change the history books. It was an opportunity of a lifetime. That was not anticipated when I actually wrote my proposal for the fellowship, but it turned what had been a very positive experience into a incredible experience that would bear fruit in the 21st century. Mexico. In 1970, few Southerners had ever seen or met a Latin American person. In 2019, there are over a million persons of Latin American ancestry in Georgia alone. Most of them have substantial indigenous heritage. Now, keep in mind, the Creeks, who once occupied almost all of Georgia, are Mesoamericans. We have Mesoamerican DNA. So, really, Today, there are probably more Native Americans, if you count Latin Americans as Native Americans, in Georgia today than there was when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I think there's great irony in that. But young people watching this video probably do not realize how radically lifestyles have changed in the last 50 years. In 1970, international travel was much more difficult than today, especially if you're a young man 20 years old who'd never been farther than Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, there was no credit cards, debit cards, or electronic cash fers, transfers. You had to carry all the money you're going to spend on your vacation, even if it was, it was a long loan like mine of several months, uh, either in cash or in traveler's checks. If something terrible happened, there was no instant source of money. You couldn't go to the ATM machine and, and pay for the car wreck or for the doctor's visit, whatever. Uh, you'd have to wait for someone to mail you money. Cellular phones, personal computers, or fax machines did not exist. There was no way to send quick communication to another country other than by telephone. Publicly accessible satellite images or Google Maps did not exist. Uh, most of the time, I was in Mexico, all I had to work with were glorified highway maps. So the, they, at that time, they didn't even have uh, what we call USGS maps. They do now. They have very good mapping, but back then, they did not. So often, wherever I went, I didn't really know where I was going until I got there. Phone calls between Atlanta and Mexico City in the daytime cost at least a dollar a minute, which is equivalent to seven dollars a minute today. So if I called home during the daytime, uh, I could easily run up a tab in a few minutes of forty dollars. 
at nighttime is about half that, but still that'd be twenty dollars, which back then would be a lot of money. That twenty dollars back then is equivalent of one hundred forty dollars today. So there's the communications that we have now between parts of the world just did not exist back then. This was also the time of the opening of the international wing of the Atlanta airport, which until that time had been classified as a regional airport. I'll show it to you. Here it is. It's not quite finished in this picture. I see some construction going on right there. But this wing was attached to the original terminal from the 1960s in order for Atlanta to have direct flight connections with other nations. Uh, the first two international flights were to Mexico City and to, I believe, Bermuda. Uh, they, then they added on several other islands in the Caribbean, Jamaica, places like that, Puerto Rico. But it was a slow growth at first of becoming a southern somewhat provincial city into a, the international city it is today. In 1970, Metropolitan Mexico City had a population of 9,067,000. It's about the size of New York City. While Metro Atlanta was 2,036,000. In 2019, Metropolitan Mexico City has a population of 21,200,000. It is one of the largest cities in the world. While Metro Atlanta has tripled in size to 6,100,000. And of course, the most amazing thing is that little old Atlanta now has the busiest airport in the world. And it keeps on growing. An amazing accomplishment to those decades. Well, I was excited. You can imagine uh, taking all those classes. I was in class 45 to 48 hours a week to meet all the requirements of the fellowship. And I, I passed all my classes. And then the day came to get on that airplane. I was real excited until I got on the airplane. It was one of the first direct flights from Atlanta to Mexico City. And I got to thinking, hey, I'm 20 years old. This is the first, second time I've ever been in an airplane. I'm going to some place to stay for three months. I don't know a soul there. What am I going to do? I mean, it's like my passage. And preparing this program, I realized that I left on the summer solstice, which is a pretty deep. That has great significance to the Native American. It's something working spiritual behind all of this. And of course, six weeks later, I'd be turning 21. So really, this, this marked a stage of my life, a rite of passage in terms of it. We got to the edge of Mexico and hit storm. I couldn't see it. I looked out and all I saw it. There's nothing. You know, I was so excited. I wanted to see what a foreign country looked like on the ground. And then big clouds, rough stormy weather, thunder clouds, and so no, that made it worse. I started worrying, you know, you don't even know where you're going. You know, we're going to, uh, into the twilight zone or something, trying these clouds. And then, the light came on, please pass it through the seat belts, and the pilot announced, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're beginning our descent to Mexico City International Airport. Just after the passing seat belt sign came on, Followed by the theme of the beautiful movie Midnight Cowboy, which seemed to be in sync with the rhythm of the jet engine slowing down as we came down into the clouds. It's an experience I never forget. The, the, the taunting song stays in mind even after all these years, the feeling of coming down through the clouds and hearing that soundtrack. Some things in life just stick in your brain, I don't know why, but again, all I saw was clouds. I As the jet came lower in elevation, it suddenly appeared a clear spot out the window, surrounded by clouds. I stuck my camera at the window and photographed it, and I was surprised to see it was all green. But when the slides came back from the developer, all I saw at the 
scale of a, of a slide viewer was just a incongruous jumble of shapes and various shades of green and gray. That was 48 years ago, and I never again looked at that slide until 2018 when I digitized many of our slides for Tetuacan. When I blew it up on the computer, I was shocked to see that the first color slide that I took of Mexico actually had Tetuacan in it. When you can see at this scale, yes, indeed, I looked down and had picked up Cerro Gordo and Tetuacan on the slide. A few minutes more, I beheld Mexico City. Oh my gosh. What in the heck have I gotten myself into? I can't even speak Spanish. With all the other classes they had me take, I didn't even have time to go to a Spanish tutor. I was about to land in a country with a city this big, and I didn't even know the language. In moments after this, I took this picture. I was absolutely petrified when I got to the international airport of the city of Mexico, as that's what that translates that sign is. Surrounded by Spanish, a chaotic atmosphere, more like a municipal market than a terminal. It's very, very different than the Atlanta terminal. I had never ridden a taxi before. I had never held down a taxi. All I had going for me is that the Mexican consulate in Atlanta had written down the name of the pension where I was to stay in the Coyacan neighborhood of Mexico City. So at least I didn't have to speak the Spanish there. And fortunately, the cab understood both the writing and a little bit of my Spanish, but not much. And he got me to the place I was supposed to go. One obstacle overcome. The name Koryakon might seem familiar to some of you. That was where Leon Trotsky, the Russian Bolshevik, lived the last decade of his life where he was murdered. It is also the uh, neighborhood that Frida, the famous Mexican artist, lived. In fact, they were friends, and it, is, it has been rumored also lovers. But their museums were open at that time. Um, quite interesting as a part of history that was never discussed when I was in school, but now is more openly discussed in the 21st century. I had just really gotten settled in my room, the pension, when I got a knock on the door and a young man, maybe three or four years older than me, something like that, is at the door and uh, Latin American and he introduced himself as a doctor from Venezuela and he was there to visit his sister who was going to university in Mexico City. Uh, he said he thought that she would enjoy meeting me while, and us doing things together while I was in Mexico and I said, well, how do you even know I was here or anything about me? But when you're young, you don't think through things like that. You just say, hmm, Senorita wants to meet me. That sounds good. So he invited me to go to lunch with me at a restaurant across the street from the Pension at this right here. This is the restaurant. Um, I had heard from the consul in Mexico, uh, in Mexican consulate in Atlanta, that uh, I had to be careful what I ate when I first came to Mexico because they had different stomach bacteria than we did, commonly known as Montezuma's of Revenge that often afflicted American terrorists when they, they came to Mexico originally. I, I said, well, I'm with a doctor. I'm sure he'll know what I can eat and can't eat. And so let's, let's go to eat. So we went to lunch. So I had, really hadn't seen much of Mexico when I had my first meal with a Latin American. Okay, are you sitting down? When I walked across the plaza in Coyacan with the doctor from Venezuela, it was the first time I'd ever entered a Mexican restaurant. That's right, my first Mexican restaurant meal was in Mexico. In 1970, there were very few Mexican restaurants in the southeast, and I, the few we had were, I'd never been in one. This is a whole new experience for me. That is the reason why I was glad to have a doctor along to tell me what to eat and what not to eat, because I had no clue what I was eating.
it was a buffet restaurant so when we came up to the buffet table I asked the doctor what would be safe to eat he told me that the shrimp this time of year were particularly good and, and quite safe if you squeeze a little lemon juice on them I figured he was a doctor from Latin America and he would know so I grabbed me a fairly large plate of the what looked to be some of the biggest shrimp I'd ever seen in my life they did taste good I'll leave it at that but there were going to be repercussions. You'll learn about that later. While the Venezuelan doctor and I are eating lunch, Senor Jose Angel Soto, the father of a 19-year-old lady who had interned at the Mexican consulate in Atlanta, called the pension in Coyacan to invite me to dinner. The daughter Gianella picked me up in her Volkswagen Beetle, then drove across the breadth of Mexico City to reach her neighborhood. I was astounded at the size of the city and its traffic. There were many avenues of up to 12 lanes of traffic, all packed with cars honking. The streets of central Mexico City were packed with cars and every car had its radio turned on. I had unknowingly arrived on the day of the final game of the World Cup Championship, pitting Italy against the local favorite Brazil. Suddenly, the entire eight million people in Mexico City went crazy, including all five million of their cars. All I could hear everywhere was. <laughs> Mexico, 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 Mexico. I thought you said it was Italy and Brazil. She said, oh, no. Yeah, she says, yes, yes, yes. Oh, it's wonderful. Brazil has just won the World Cup. I said, well, why is everybody cheering if Brazil won? It sounds like you were saying Mexico, Mexico. I said, oh, yes, yes, of course. Anytime a Latin American team wins, we all cheer because it's like it's Mexico. And I said, okay. Well, as I said, I was in a whole new world, and it just so happened today was the World Cup. Nueva Santa Maria was a suburb built uh, in the mid 20th century. Uh, now is in the heart of urban development. Uh, you would never know it was a suburb at the time, but the houses then were fairly new if you figure it was mid 20th century, 40s, 30s, that period of time, and we're talking about 1970. So these houses weren't that old at the time, but still surrounded by development. You notice Tlatilco, that's one of the most famous archeological sites in Mexico, one of the first places where civilization occurred. It is mostly now houses over in this area was a park where you could see some ruins, but most of the, the town site was covered by development. It, was, it occurred in a time when archaeology had not as developed a reputation like it did now in Mexico. But I'd never been in a place like that in my life. I mean, it was, it was, I might as well been going to New York City. In fact, it was denser than New York City. So for an architect, uh, I was just had my mouth open that there were places like this where every square foot was covered in houses. This is a street near their house, Azcapotasco. Uh, the name of the community was Colonia Nueva Santa Maria. Typical street scene, most of the houses are two stories, 100% lot coverage. The streets had eucalyptus trees mainly on them. I didn't see any other types of trees, maybe a few oaks, but a very dense development. This typified thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of acres in Mexico City look just like this. This is the, the burbs, if you can imagine it. It was a whole different world of street vendors, people yelling out, selling uh, food to eat, people on the streets, very, different feeling than any American city. 
We got to their house. It was quite different. It was one story, whereas most of the houses there were two stories. Uh, you notice it has grass. I think it was the only house in the whole Nueva Santa Maria that had grass, although it, their grass is about the size of somebody's outdoor deck in Atlanta. Uh, they had a gate here where they could pull their car in to wash it on the grass. They also had a garage and carport here. Uh, they had some type of tree that's kind of like a magnolia. I'm not sure. Maybe it's a tropical magnolia. And they had a rooftop house for their servants. This is one of them there. Euphemia was her name. And uh, was quite modern on the inside. It's kind of a 1950-ish feeling to it. I think that's when they built the house and they had the same furnishings still. But it was quite a lovely meal. The Mexican middle class women really know how to cook. And since they have servants, they, at least back then they did, they could really put on the show. So we had a multi-course dinner. After the dinner, the two daughters, Gianella, who was 19, and Alibu, who was 17, wanted to dance. Alibu's real name was Ruth, but as a young girl, she had thought she had been born in Hollywood, so she called herself Alibu, and that, that name stuck. They had just purchased an album by Credence Clearwater Revival, and uh, they wanted to dance. Here I was a captive dancer, and I said, do you like to dance? And so we ended up dancing to about midnight, maybe 11 o'clock, it was late. Now we just danced, that's all that happened. We were just dancing at a wonderful time, first in the living room, and then when the Sotos are about ready to go to bed, we moved over to the back of the garage. And that's where normally afterward we would dance to get away from everybody else. So they would have to listen to the rock music. And Senior Soto got up a little bit after he'd already gone to bed and said, why don't I just stay? And said, it's too late to drive, for Janela to drive me to another part of town to be dangerous. And then we could have breakfast in the morning before I went back to Koyakon. I said, all right, fine. I mean, so they gave me Ali Boo's bedroom to sleep in. And Ali Boo slept in the same room as Gianella. Oh, we're off to a great start, aren't we? Well, about three in the morning, I woke up violently ill. I threw up all over her room, her carpets, her bedspread, her walls, her furniture, her shoes. I think even one went in the closet. I mean, it was just, you couldn't imagine a worse thing for a gringo to do to repay the kindness shown by the Soto family. Absolutely disaster. But by 8 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't even move. I was paralyzed, literally. I had salmonella, the most violent type of salmonella. That's the bad news. Of course, this is what came one of those miracles that I was telling you about. What if that had happened when I was in that pension and I knew nobody? And what would have happened to me? You know, I'd, uh, unable to speak much Spanish. I'd run up most of the, the fellowship probably for medical bills the first two days. And uh, I might have died. I mean, I was that sick. It's about the sickest I'd ever been in my life at that time. Well, more miracles. Not only was I with friendly people when I got deathly ill, but in addition to being a professor at the Politecnico in biology, Senor Soto owned a small pharmaceutical company. And guess what's one of the products they manufactured? The antibiotic used to treat salmonella. So he went straight over to his plan. It was kind of illegal to do that, but he, he knew it was a desperate situation. He called the doctor also, got his permission to give me the medicine. Uh, and brought back the treatment for salmonella. Then the, when the doctor came, he made a house visit, which would be unheard of in the United States to have a doctor coming to a house to treat somebody, but he did. The doctor gave me metabolic fluids and IVs, uh, plus antibiotics, plus something else, which probably saved my life. I mean, I might have died, or really, is that bad? Maybe I was strong enough to somewhat survive after days, but it would have been a long haul to recover without the medical treatment. Another miracle. I slept around for a few days, but with the medication, I was able to walk maybe in three or four days, and within a week, I was not sick at all. 
In the meantime, I'd missed my appointment with Dr. Pena Chan. It had been set up and he was going to be out of town or unavailable for two weeks. So we had about two weeks for me to kill before I got on my assigned activities. I had a list of archaeological sites I was supposed to see in Mexico City. But in addition, the girls wanted to show me the town. And that they did. I was like a small Georgia boy, town Georgia boy coming to the big city, and I did love it. It was like a world I never knew existed. Yee-ha! Radio Rama! Son las seis y media en la capital de la República, Canal X, E, Z, D, el Amajín de Música de México. July 2nd, it was time for Olibu to graduate from Queen Mary High School. This is, was an incredible experience. It was not like a graduation in the United States at all. Most of the ceremony consisted of the students dressing in traditional Mexican costumes and performing folk dances. Uh, incredible experience. I'll show you a picture in a second of what it actually looked like. but. Two things occurred there that have great significance later. We, when we came out, the crowd, there's a beautiful woman off on the side watching me, uh, smoking a cigarette, but it was the same woman that was in the picture that the doctor said was his sister. Now, what was she doing there? She was not in the crowd. She'd been waiting for him to come out. And then I realized that the whole thing with me, with the doctor showing up right after I landed in the pension and telling me to eat something that was highly poisonous, was very, very fishy. Uh, then at that, uh, almost that moment, the, when the, the pretty 
so-called sister, the guy was walking up to me, smiling. Roof pulled me aside and said, I want you to meet my friend Alicia. Alicia lived two blocks away in Nueva Santa Maria. She had graduated two years earlier from Queen Mary School. She spoke three languages fluently and she was enrolled in college at Anahuac University and also uh, working part-time in her family's business. Highly intelligent. She was actually Sephardic Jewish in heritage, a first-generation Mexican. Her family had converted to Catholicism in France in order to escape the Nazis and then were given asylum in Mexico. But actually, Alicia had been born in the United States and she had a United States birth certificate, which had proved to be very interesting in the future. But by me being pulled aside to meet Alicia, who I was instantly enchanted with, I didn't talk with the so-called sister and she walked away. In retrospect, I have two possible explanations of why I was set up for me to be poisoned with the, the shrimp. One, it could be a cult, because I knew that professor back at Georgia Tech was in the occult, and uh, some of, several of the students in our class were, and it could have been something they set up, but that distance, I wonder, I mean, it's pretty high tech to know where I was going to be, which pension I was going to be at, and when I was going to be there, possible. More likely was it was the doctor was a communist agent, either working for Cuba or Russia. You see, I had been asked to do some favors for naval intelligence while I was in Mexico, which I was glad to do. Nothing really terribly dangerous or exciting, but uh, while in Guatemala, I was going to make contact with a former graduate of Georgia Tech and a former midshipman in Guatemala City, and then also I was to go out to a mission run by the Marinolers, which they believed was receiving arms from the Irish Republican Army, and also stolen arms from the U.S. Army, from, I don't know what you call it, I don't know if you call them traitors or not, because they really weren't giving it to the enemy, but anyway, they were stealing arms in the Washington area, and then shipping them by jet down to Guatemala to provide weapons for a new guerrilla movement. And they want to know who these people were. You know, why would Christians, Irish Republican Army, and, uh, and then uh, Roman Catholics within the U.S. Army be sending stolen weapons to rebels in Guatemala, Maya rebels, and I was to check them out. So I think it's more likely to be Soviet or Cuban, but I'm not sure. But as it turned out, the uh, guerrillas were not capitalists, I say, but they were anti-Russian, anti-communist guerrillas. They were uh, democratic socialists, for lack of a better term, or, or Christian socialists. I mean, that's a better term. But that's what that was all about. But I never really knew. And obviously, whatever they planned to do didn't happen. And, and actually, after the graduation, I never saw anything strange again. So maybe they just steered away. But it, the whole thing of me being getting, getting sick on the first day was no accident. Well, before we end this program, I'm going to take you, give you a little taste of what that incredible graduation ceremony was like. In part two begins 
and my first day at the Museum of Antipatia, and then we go to Teotihuacan, and we get to the meat of this program. You're in for many surprises. But as we part, uh, I want you to, as an ending part, give for me to use a sample of the rich cultural life in Mexico today. This is from YouTube, but it's a street band, lovely people playing that, that typifies the rich culture of Mexico that you need to know. Often in the anthropological, ecological programs that you see on TV, it's quite sterile. It doesn't give the whole picture of what it's like to be there. And you can't understand the emotions I felt when I was going up the mountain above Teotihuacan unless you understand the culture of the place there. We'll see you on part two. Thank you.